Standing guard over the Utah-Wyoming border, the massive cliffs of the Wasatch Mountains erupt out of canyon floors, dividing the rolling grasslands to the east from the salt valleys to the west. The immense features, which once echoed the bark of the largest steam locomotives on Earth, still reverberate with the drumming of mighty diesels climbing the Wasatch Grade. This is where lonely western towns still decorate the right-of-way, where trains trace the route of the first transcontinental railroad. This is Union Pacific's Evanston Subdivision. Following in the footsteps of the Mormon pioneers, Overland Stage and Pony Express, this double-track main line between Ogden, Utah and Green River, Wyoming, carries the steel wheels of commerce from all over this great land and the world. High-priority stack trains race beneath the western skies. Unit oil, grain, and vehicle trains twist through wild, rugged canyons. Drawbars strain as massive 200-car manifests reach the apex of the Wasatch Grade. Join Seven Idea Productions on an amazing tour through Utah's stunning Echo and Weber Canyons and Wyoming's lonely plateaus and badlands. Plus, see Union Pacific's Big Boy number 4014 returning to its home rails for the first time in over half a century. Shot in beautiful high definition, the panoramas of the West come alive on the widescreen. This is the Wasatch Grade, Union Pacific's Evanston Sub. Part of Union Pacific Salt Lake Division, the Evanston Sub runs west of Green River, Wyoming, through the Wasatch Mountains to Ogden, Utah. It covers a distance of 176.3 miles, ending at Cecil Junction at the north end of Ogden Yard. Today, we will be running west to east, starting at Ogden Union Station. Visits include Riverdale and Uinta, where the line enters the lower Weber Canyon. The Evanston Sub continues east, following the Weber River through Strawberry and Morgan, where it enters the upper Weber Canyon and passes the Devil Slide. At Echo, the railroad and the river part company, and the line turns abruptly to the northeast, following Echo Creek through the canyon of the same name. This is a highly scenic area, and we will spend some extra time here. The climb up the west side of the Wasatch Grade continues through Emory and Castle Rock, Mains 1 and 2 cross over each other at Curvo, just before they crest the summit of the Wasatch. The easy grade down the east side takes us into the state of Wyoming, and past the historic Union Pacific Yard at Evanston. From here, the line turns again to the southeast as it follows the Bear River through Millis, before taking a more northerly course through Altamont and Aspen, Spring Valley, and Leroy. Turning east again through Carter, and Granger, where the Pocatello subdivision out of southern Idaho joins the Evanston sub. Continuing on an eastward heading, the line passes several mines where Trona is processed into soda ash and shipped by rail. The grade then heads through Bryan and Peru before dropping down to meet the Green River and our final destination, CPG 817, better known as West Green River. The giant cut in the ground before us is the original grade of the first transcontinental railroad, which was completed just a short distance from where we are standing, at Promontory Summit, Utah. To the south, beyond the Promontory Mountains, lies the expanse of the Great Salt Lake. 
much saltier than the oceans of the world. It covers nearly 2,000 square miles of desert and is the largest lake in the U.S. outside of the Great Lakes region. To the east, the Wasatch Range erupt out of the desert floor like a huge natural barrier between Utah and southwest Wyoming. It is through these mountains we must travel. At the foot of the mountains north of Salt Lake City, the historic Ogden Union Station still stands, just as it did when it welcomed passengers along the first transcontinental railroad. Constructed in 1924 in the Spanish colonial revival style, this beautiful building is actually the third to be built. It replaced an older station which was destroyed by fire in 1923. During its heyday, as many as 120 trains per day passed through Union Station, and passengers from all over the country and the world boarded and detrained on one of 17 tracks. Amtrak's Pioneer made stops here until it was discontinued in 1997. Today, rail commuters can board Utah's front runner just north of the old depot and pass by on two adjacent tracks. This classic station could have been lost to history, but thankfully was turned over to the city of Ogden in 1977 and renovated to house various museums, including the Utah State Railroad Museum and the Eccles Rail Center, among others. On display in the parking lot is a French boxcar which was built in 1885 and given as a gesture of gratitude by the people of France to the U.S. after World War II. It was used for carrying troops around France during both world wars and one of 49 French railroad cars that were shipped to America in 1949. One for each of the then 48 states and Washington, D.C. The cars were filled with tens of thousands of gifts from French citizens and known as the Mercy Train. Nearby, a 1918 built Baldwin 060 switcher stands on display as well as a pair of cabooses from the Union Pacific and Denver and Rio Grande Western. When visiting Ogden, it is worth taking a few hours and exploring all of the historical railroad equipment that can be found here. A boiler for the Rio Grande 223, which is currently under restoration, sits at the north end of the station. Next to it is a classic rotary plow built in 1912 by Alco as the Oregon-Washington Railway and Navigation Company number 061. Behind it in the consist is a 1910 heavy lift crane built for UP by Industrial Works and stationed in Salina, Kansas. Moving to the south side of the station, we find the Eccles Rail Center and a nice collection of locomotives on display under a protective roof. They include the UP 833, an FEF-2 class Northern built in 1939, a DD-40AX Centennial number 6916 retired in 1985, the DNRGW-5371, the last Rio Grande SD-40T-2 tunnel motor retired in 2008, SP-7457, the first SD-45 built for the Southern Pacific in 1966, and the UPX-26, one of two surviving gas turbine electric locomotives built in 1961 by GE. Sounding like a jet engine, they were nicknamed Big Blows and produced over 8,500 horsepower. It is great to see this amazing collection representing state-of-the-art locomotive technology from 1939 to 1975. And this is just part of the collection. Tucked behind the locomotives are several pieces of rolling stock including the Olympic torch car, which carried the flame by rail to nearby Salt Lake City for the 2002 Winter Games. The museum is located just south of UP's Ogden Yard. A northbound front runner crosses over the Ogden Y as it heads for the transit station near the museum. Operated by the Utah Transit Authority since 2008, Front rudder trains operate between Ogden, Salt Lake City, and Provo and handle over 4 million passengers per year. A westbound stack train has just come off the Evanston subdivision on the number 3 main 
bypassing Riverdale Yard. It enters the Salt Lake subdivision at the Ogden Y for a 35.7 mile trip to Salt Lake City. The train could also enter the Shafter subdivision west of here and continue across the bottom of the Great Salt Lake via the former WP line to Wendover and on to Oakland, California via Silver Zone and Donner Pass. A pair of remote-controlled GP15-1s move a cut of hoppers north out of the Riverdale Yard. A short stack train approaches the Ogden Y. UP 6786 has just a few overseas containers in tow, which will be added to a stack train in Riverdale Yard. The train pulls through the Y and back south to the yard. It's a cool sunny morning in early summer, with a temperature in the upper 60s. By midday it will rise to the upper 90s, and we hope to be well on our way up the Wasatch Grade by then. The train passes under the 31st Street signals as it continues backing south into the yard. Also known as East Yard, Riverdale Yard was built in 1942 by the Ogden Union Railway and Depot Company, a subsidiary of the Southern Pacific and Union Pacific Railroads. Setting on 305 acres just south of the original Ogden Yard, it helped ease congestion brought on by the influx of rail traffic during and after World War II. Today, locomotives are serviced here, and trains are made up for destinations all across the UP system. UPY 613 and 664 are seen again, moving their hoppers west toward 31st Street. GP 15-1s are rated at 1,500 horsepower and are usually employed as yard goats, and you will notice they are not equipped with dynamic brakes. The absence of the fan and blister between the exhaust stacks on the hood are the indication. Looking through the yard, we spot a former Southern Pacific GP40P-2 one of three units of this type built for SP commuter trains around San Francisco. Its original number was SP3198, and today it still earns its keep switching cars at Riverdale Yard. It's time for us to head east along the Evanston sub, and our first eastbound is seen approaching on the number one main. UP8594 leads an empty tank train out of Ogden behind a trio of EMDs.
From Cecil Junction to East Riverdale, the Evanston Sub consists of three main tracks, narrowing to two for most of the trip until reaching West Green River. The Giant U is for the town of Uinta, located just west of the passage through Weber Canyon. Uinta was an important stage stop for travelers heading west to Salt Lake City and was considered as a possible location for the passenger station that ultimately was built in Ogden. UP 6756 East leads an empty grain train up Main 2 on the approach to Weber Canyon. Uinta marks the start of the 1.14% Wasatch grade for eastbound trains. This fairly easy climb was made possible by the addition of a second main line completed between 1916 and 1926. The original grade was 1.77%. A pair of radio-controlled GEs, including a new Tier 4 C45AH, lettered UP2804, add their muscle to the rear of the train. As the train continues into Weber Canyon, we hear a series of explosions. Turning back to the west, a smoke trail appears in the sky. Nearby Hill Air Force Base is hosting an air show this weekend, and we find the aerobatics a pleasant distraction in between trains. While the show continues on, a green light appears on Main 1 as a westbound Z train glides down the grade. Between Riverdale and Curvo, near the summit of the grade, trains experience left-hand running with eastbounds using the number two track and westbounds on the number one. Here, the grades are around 100 yards apart, with track two higher up to the north. At the entrance to Weber Canyon, we can see the two grades as UP 8105 West approaches us on Main 1. Higher up on Main 2, an eastbound heads into the canyon.
The Weber River carves its path through the Wasatch Mountains on a 125-mile course from the Uinta Mountains to the Great Salt Lake. The route provided the railroad with its needed breach of the Wasatch. An eastbound stack train enters a lower Weber River Canyon on Main 2, while traffic on I-84 pass beneath both grades. UP 4522 West takes the lower main one. This is the 51 local out of Riverdale Yard. It runs between Ogden and Echo. Moving farther up the canyon, we are just above Devil's Gate, and the rails are now on the south side of the Weber River. An eastbound K-Line stack train heads up the canyon. Near Strawberry, the railroad crosses the river on a pair of through truss bridges, as demonstrated by UP 4953 East. This train is UP's Salad Shooter, or the ZDLSK. 
This high-priority train carries fresh produce between Delano, California and Selkirk, New York. Today's train is a short one and includes several boxcars as well as reefers. At Strawberry, the railroad exits the confines of the canyon and races through the lower Weaver River Valley. Near Mountain Green, the eastbound 51 local parallels I-84 as it heads for Echo, Utah. During our visit in the early spring, the Wasatch were still draped in winter's white as the westbound local, symboled the LUJ-51, heads for Ogden behind classic EMD power. The railroad continues east through the community of Morgan and into Round Valley where it enters the upper Weber Canyon. Another pair of bridges are found at milepost 964.26 near the portals of Tunnel 9. UP 6028 West heads through the scene on the number one track. We are set for a perfectly timed meet. UP 6516 East soon appears on track two.
A recent snowfall accents the texture of the rocky cliffs above the main line, and the sun tries to lighten the scene while the trains pass on what would otherwise be a dreary afternoon. After the eastbound disappears into Tunnel 9, we get a surprise on the rear of the westbound. SP-343, one of the last remaining unpatched Southern Pacific locomotives on the UP roster, is handling the DPU chores today. A nice catch. Let's change direction and change seasons. Tunnel 8 is milepost 963.2 for both main tracks. The 51 local is seen again, heading east. Some of the tank cars in this consist are bound for the Union Tank Car Repair Facility in Evanston, Wyoming, which we will show you later. Notice the car on the flat, which must have been in a recent accident. After exiting Tunnel 8, trains continue through the upper Weber River Canyon between Taggart's and Devil's Slide. UP 8514 West leads a manifest downgrade to Ogden on a hot summer afternoon. We first see Red Rock in Upper Weber Canyon at Devil Slide, a popular attraction that drew railroad passengers in the early days of the Transcontinental Railroad, and the attraction continues to this day. Another pair of bridges take the railroad over the Weber River near the Devil Slide cement plant. 
Located near the small community of Croydon, this facility has been in operation since 1906, thanks to ample limestone in the area near the Devil's Slide. And if you're wondering what the Devil's Slide really is, well, here you go. This unique rock formation is made up of two parallel slabs of limestone rock, 40 feet high, 20 feet apart, and around 200 feet long. The first pioneers in the 1840s referred to it as the gutter defile, and this unholy-looking slide continues to draw interested souls to this very day. It's time to switch our interest back to the steel rails and a westbound passing through Devil Slide. The Weber River flows under the bridges at the Devil's Slide, and from the riverbank, we can see the wooden railroad bridge, which leads to the cement plant just out of view. The westbound 62 local is seen again. East of Devil Slide, the railroad enters the upper Weber Valley and enjoys some nearly level running through Hennifer and Echo. On a dark, cold morning, the 51 local makes another trip to Echo, where it'll switch cars and swap trains with the 61 local out of Evanston. At first sight, Echo, Utah is a striking location on our climb to the summit of the Wasatch Mountains. The steep bluffs rising along the north bank of the Weber River are decorated with basalt rock formations. Early pioneers traveling through the area found one group of rocks to be of great interest. In the evening, these seemingly feminine figures with hats cast long, eerie shadows over the hill. They were coined the Witch Rocks a name which has remained with them to this day. The rails of the Transcontinental Railroad arrived in Echo in January of 1869. It became a fuel and water stop for locomotives until the end of steam. UP5862 leads a westbound stack train through Echo on a warm summer evening.
Echo stands at an elevation of 5,777 feet above sea level and originated as a stopover along the Mormon Trail. The Weber Stage Station was located nearby and Pony Express riders changed horses here in 1860 until the telegraph made them obsolete in 1861. Today, the small town sits along the shoulder of old Highway 30, bypassed by the interstate decades ago. At Echo, we leave the Weber River behind and enter spectacular Echo Canyon. The tall red cliffs mark the trail between the rolling grasslands of Wyoming and the salt desert of Utah. Native Americans and buffalo pass beneath these cliffs, followed by wagon trains, Mormon pioneers, the Overland Stage, Pony Express, and of course, the Transcontinental Railroad. Steamboat Rock is one of the prominent features of the Lower Canyon, which has recently been touched by an early spring snowstorm. We will spend some extra time here and enjoy the countless photographic opportunities the canyon provides. The acoustics of the canyon make for great train listening as well as watching. UP 5838 East leads a long manifest bound for North Platte, Nebraska up the number two track. A single EMD SE70 ACE lends its 4300 horsepower to the effort from the middle of the train.
UP 6516 East leads an empty grain train into Echo Canyon. When it comes to acoustics, the canyon is the perfect amphitheater for this duet of vintage EMDs. Let's watch and listen to their performance on the point of today's 61 local out of Evanston, Wyoming. The early summer brings vibrant colors and contrasts to lower Echo Canyon, along with temperatures in the 80s. The unmistakable sound of SD40-2s is again heard as the 61 local leads another cut of tank cars up the hill to Evanston. From the opposite side of the canyon, we watch a GE ES45AC and an EMD SD70 ACE lead an eastbound vehicle train up the Wasatch grade.
An older GE AC 4400 shoves on the rear of the train. During our visits in the spring and summer of 2016, signal crews were busy with a block lengthening project to accommodate longer trains. These classic signals will soon be removed from service in favor of the new LED variety. Signal 9497 shows a clear on main 1 for a westbound stacker coming down the mountain. Milepost 943 marks the 5,665-foot center siding of Emory. UP3215 leads the 61 local up the grade on Main 2.
The afternoon sun highlights rocky cliffs above Emory as UP-8974 leads a westbound Z train down the hill. UP 58380 is seen again just above Emory as it rounds a curve and ducks under the old highway. At Castle Rock, Mains 1 and 2 are again on separate grades. Main 2 heads through cuts and fills as it heads toward the summit of the Wasatch. The 61 local puts on a fantastic show of sight and sound as the pair of 16-cylinder 645 diesels purr and throb their way up the 1.14% grade in a snowstorm.
Named for the rock feature above the train, Castle Rock was a location of a Pony Express and stage station. This beautiful panorama just off of Interstate 80 is a popular location for photographing trains. Looking to the north, the number one track appears out of a draw and circles around below track two. UP 6028 West heads down the grade. The SP-343 is seen again, adding dynamic braking to the rear of the train. As the UP built west of the Wasatch Summit, complications with Tunnel 2 forced the railroad to build a seven-mile detour line down the south branch of Echo Creek. It was abandoned when the tunnel was completed in 1869. That temporary grade is now the route that Interstate 80 takes to the summit. The railroad veers to the north as it climbs to the summit of the Wasatch. A westbound Z train with UPS trailers heads down the number one track after crossing over track two at Curvo. This original line over the summit has a grade of 1.77%. When the second grade was completed in 1916, eastbound trains were routed over its easier 1.14% and this became the westbound track. Dark storm clouds threaten rain along the Utah-Wyoming border as the train glides down the west side.
The bore of the old summit tunnel for Main 2 stands in the weeds. It was bypassed with a deep cut as Union Pacific prepared for the arrival of the Big Boy steam locomotive in September of 1941. On a side note, in May of 2014, we caught Big Boy number 4014 heading through the cut while on its historic trip to Cheyenne to be restored to operating condition. We'll show you more of that run a little later. Looking west, the old original Main 1 is now above Main 2. They cross over each other in two separate tunnels at Curvo. However, access is limited in this area. Just east of the crossing, UP 8951 leads another short salad shooter up the grade on Main 2. The official name of this train is the Fresh Produce Express, symboled the ZDLSK. This train has been given a number of nicknames over the years, including the Superfruit and the Moses Train, because even the waters part to let this high-priority train pass. Like the train we saw the other day at Strawberry, this one has a lot of non-refrigerated boxcars in its consist. Peering through the cut, we see the head end of the train knocking down the signal near milepost 928 as it reaches the summit of the Wasatch Mountains. A thunderstorm is brewing over the Wasatch Mountains as we reposition ourselves at the summit of the grade. Thunder rolls over the high country, and a headlight appears on track one. UP 7697 West prepares for the 25-mile descent down Echo Canyon. As the stack train continues over the apex, UP 8185 East completes the final leg of the climb to Summit on track two.
while the head end of the train is now gliding down the east slope to Evanston. The mid-train remote is still working hard to pull the remainder of the train up the grade. Soon, it too will be transitioning into dynamics. Wasatch stands at an elevation of 6,799 feet. It was established as a railroad camp during the building of the first transcontinental railroad in 1868. This water tank still stands some distance from the main lines. Part of the old number two track to the east of the abandoned tunnel is still used for staging maintenance of way equipment, like this tamper and regulator seen here. It's a cold afternoon at the summit of the Wasatch Mountains as the 61 local is seen again cresting the grade. A late afternoon break in the storm clouds reveals snow-covered mountains in the state of Wyoming. The view across the open country is spectacular, yet fleeting as the sun dips low in the west. Headlights of another eastbound appear out of the cut on Main 2, as UP 5688 East leads a 211-car monster manifest over the summit and into the night.
A westbound is seen above the train on Main 1. The DPU of the westbound disappears over the summit in northeast Utah as another day of rail fanning comes to an end. When one thinks of Wyoming, the mind may conjure up visions of cattle roaming the open grasslands or snow fences decorating the rolling hills. That's what we find here, although we are not in the state of Wyoming. Yet, this is still Utah for at least another mile. An old UP flat car has found new life as a maintenance of way bridge along the tracks near milepost 925. Have you ever noticed the stripes on certain telegraph poles? A single stripe indicates a quarter mile. Two stripes is a half mile marker. Three is three quarter. And the mile has four stripes. Two above and two below the mile board. This is a holdover to when railroads used code lines for communication. Here on the Evanston sub, there are 40 poles per mile, and each tenth pole is marked. This way, train crews and track workers would know exactly where they were with regards to the milepost. Before locomotives became computerized with digital speedometers, engineers could time the distance between the poles to check their speed. It's an old technology that has slowly faded into history. UP 8367 West leads a modern-day stack train past milepost 925.5 as it climbs to the summit of the Wasatch. The sun prepares to break over the hills of western Wyoming. We are on the outskirts of Evanston this morning, and the flashing yellow on track 2 is for UP 8255 East. The Z train glides down the eastern slope of the Wasatch on its way to Green River.
Just west of the UP's Evanston Yard is the Union Tank Car Repair and Maintenance Facility. You've probably seen the UTLX lettering on tank cars around North America. Evanston, Wyoming is one of several repair and maintenance facilities based in the U.S. Working about the yard is the UTCX 1302, a GE 80 tonner built in 1949 for the America Smelting and Refining Company in Tucson, Arizona. These switch engines are powered by two 470 horsepower diesel engines, one for each truck. The operator appears to be only using one of the engines to do the work today. A cut of cars are spotted and the brake man ties down the car. With this part of the job complete, the 1302 heads off for its next assignment. Evanston began life in November of 1868 as a saloon inside a tent, and as you can imagine, the town's history is tied with the building of the first transcontinental railroad. It was named for UP surveyor James Evan, who guided the UP's westward march through the Wyoming Territory. The UP yard is located just to the east of the facility. A rock train is tied down in a house track located near the historic roundhouse and rail yard. The 61 local is also tied down a little closer to us. It runs five days a week, and the crew goes on duty around 7 a.m. The historic roundhouse and rail yard sits on 27 acres and was used primarily to service engines and rail cars. UP closed the facility in 1971 and deeded the site to the city of Evanston, which has been working to restore and preserve this amazing piece of railroad history. The semicircular roundhouse is one of only a few that are still standing intact. In fact, it is the only complete roundhouse on the UP between Ogden and Sacramento. It consists of four sections and 28 bays with an operational turntable. Restoration of the first section was completed in 2009, and as you can see, there is still much work to be done. The nearby powerhouse is still owned by the UP, although the city hopes to obtain and rehabilitate it as well. The entire site is on the National Register of Historic Places. This depot was built by the UP in 1900. It is located east of the roundhouse. UP 7965 West leads an early morning Z train through the historic town just after sunrise.
Departing Evanston, the railroad takes a southeast course following the Bear River through a fertile valley of lush grass, green with the rains of spring. It is etched along its east side by colorful bluffs and canyons. Cattle graze on a nearby ranch, while thunder echoes angrily through the mountains, promising more water from the heavens. Wyoming is a great plateau covering nearly 98,000 square miles and broken by numerous mountain ranges. The Transcontinental Railroad carefully picks its way around the mountains, benches, and flats, following the easy course of rivers whenever possible. An eastbound passes through Millis on the far end of the valley. For the next 12.6 miles to Aspen, both tracks are governed by CTC. The train continues toward Altamont as the railroad begins to change course again to the northeast. To the south is a location of Bear River City, or at least where it used to be. The rowdy Wild West town was located right along this creek and consisted of stores, gambling parlors, and saloons. Lumberjacks supplying ties to the approaching Transcontinental Railroad settled here in 1867 and the population grew to nearly 2,000. The town dried up when the building of the railroad was completed and many residents relocated to Evanston. Nothing remains of Bear River City today, except for this plaque showing where it used to be. Returning trackside, we can see some work going on along the right-of-way as a major block lengthening project and signal upgrade is underway. The much longer trains of today and coming of positive train control are both contributing factors to the upgrade. The 61 local is seen again as it takes a cut of tank cars east toward Choppy Draw. The train continues toward Altamont, which is the location of the Aspen and Altamont tunnels, both of which are over a mile long. The tunnels are located in the middle of a cattle ranch and are not accessible to the public. Respecting the private property rights of the ranchers, we continue Railroad East. A pair of older block signals face outward after a recent cutover during the block lengthening project. This is Reagan and is located about six miles east of the Aspen and Altamont tunnels. 
UP5888 East glides down an easy grade with a two mile long manifest in a 4x1 configuration. Midway through the train, a lone AC4400, lettered UP6400, operates by remote control. This unit was built in 1995 as the SP330 and has recently been repainted. The Evanston subdivision continues in a northeast heading between the Bigelow Bench and Tom's Draw. A dog catch crew aboard the UP 7490 West makes a course for Ogden, Utah under threatening skies. The previous crew was close to going dead on the law after being delayed by a derailment west of Green River. A changing of the guard has just taken place at Leroy, milepost 890.5. 
This is the location of a 1,079-foot center siding. The short piece of track runs between both mains and is controlled by a hand throw switch. Wooden snow fences decorate the hillside above the main line in classic Wyoming fashion as UP 5197 East approaches with a hot Z train. Interstate 80 can be seen in the distance to the south. At a lonely crossing on Route 412 north of Fort Bridger, Wyoming, stands the little town of Carter. This is a quiet place, outside of the occasional passing car or train, where the ambient sound of wind-blown grass and leaves provide the only company. A maintenance-of-way crane sits on the west end of a house track, which once served a greater importance for the community. Carter has that look of a one-street town on a western movie set, where you might expect to see John Wayne or Gary Cooper stepping out at high noon to face his enemy. On the far side of the old Union Pacific building, a two-story false front motel still marks the east end of town. In better days, it served as a house of ill repute. The Transcontinental Railroad was the first Main Street of America and towns located along this vital line of commerce had a real chance to thrive. The house track mentioned earlier leads to the wooden platform of what was once the freight depot. The steel rails tied Carter, and many towns just like it, to Chicago, San Francisco, Kansas City, and beyond. Carter was even the seat of Sweetwater County until Green River gained in prominence in 1875. The tall brush and rundown buildings that you see today speak of a town bypassed and mostly forgotten, seeing only a few motorists that happen to turn off the interstate, or railroaders that pass control point CPG 876 on the Evanston sub. The westbound local out of Evanston approaches Carter as it heads back to town with a short consist of three EMD locomotives and two cars.
prickly pear cactus show off their early summer flowers on a small hill near the main line, just east of Carter. UP 5878 West leads a manifest through the reverse S curve along Muddy Creek at milepost 873. The manifest heads around a curve near milepost 874, while UP 8030 East appears with a Z train on Main 2.
The rails continue through a seemingly empty land, marked with broken off cliffs and badlands, where very little grows. But what may seem like a wasteland is actually quite valuable just beneath the surface. A lonely signal bridge stands as it has for over half a century at Granger, milepost 847.1. The Pocatello subdivision out of Pocatello, Idaho joins the Evanston sub. Today, this busy junction is quiet, with every signal showing an all-red aspect. Looking east toward Green River, trains can be seen parked in the distance. Looking west, more trains are tied down. The line to the left is the Evanston sub. On the far right, the Pocatello sub. Everything is quiet and still under a sultry sky that promises more thunderstorms this afternoon. The previous day, a westbound stack train derailed at Peru, just west of Green River, taking both main tracks out of service. For the past 24 hours, UP crews along with RJ Corman have been working around the clock to clean up the wreck and get service restored. The derailment happened just west of the crossovers at Peru, milepost 824.9. Our original guess was that one of the cars had picked a switch. However, the crossovers remained intact. Track panels have been put in place on Main 2, and a ballast train with former Rock Island hoppers carefully dumps ballast along the new track. While this is going on, RJ Corman crews are still ripping up the damaged track on Main 1. A CAT 3300 excavator picks up the heavy rail and shakes it loose from the ties. We take a few moments to watch the crew at work. The first goal is to reopen Main 2 and get the highest priority Z trains through, then continue to work on Main 1. One thing's for sure, when the line is reopened, there's going to be a serious log jam of trains. The next morning, we return to Granger, which is located 23 miles west of the derailment at Peru. During the night, Main 2 was opened and trains have been slowly moving past the derailment site. UP 7979 East appears on the Pocatello sub. The Z train will stop at Granger and wait its turn through the Peru bottleneck. Looking the other direction, UP 8418 West leads a grain train onto the Pocatello sub. The second unit is a former Southern Pacific AC 4400 number 305, now patched to UP 6340.
The next movement is a pair of young antelope that are cautiously trying to cross the five sets of tracks. Fortunately, they have learned to stop, look, and listen, and decide to wait for traffic to clear. UP 8929 East is next up and departs Granger on a clear signal. The line between Granger and West Green River is governed by CTC, while most of the Evanston sub is controlled by automatic block signals. A second Z train led by UP 8019 heads east on the Evanston sub. Finally, UP 7979 gets a light to enter the Evanston sub and proceed to Green River.
A winter storm blows in across the bluffs of southwest Wyoming, bringing with it light snow and a frigid breeze. Deep in the ground below us and out of the elements, up to 300 people are hard at work in the Trona mines. Trona is a sodium carbonate compound that is processed into soda ash, or baking soda. Covering approximately 1,000 square miles, Wyoming has the largest deposit of Trona in the world. It is processed at several facilities in the area and loaded onto covered hoppers to be shipped. Trona is Wyoming's largest export. In 2015, its mines produced over 17 million tons and employed over 2,400 people. On the surface, besides the processing plants, hundreds of covered hoppers waiting to be loaded or shipped are stretched out as far as the eye can see. Soda ash has many uses, including glass making, a technology that goes back to the ancient Egyptians, soap, toothpaste, glue, and many other items you find in your home. It is estimated that at the current rate of production, Wyoming's Trona supply will last over 2,000 years. A cut of loaded soda ash cars come off the 9.7-mile Solvay industrial lead at milepost 830.7. It will pull to a stop at Bryan. The train meets the UP 7461 West on Main 1. An eastbound stack train rolls through Bryan, a place that is always busy with soda ash trains. Returning to the season of summer and the derailment site at Peru, let's see how the work is going. As you can tell, Main 2 is back in service and a tamper and regulator are working on Main 1. Trains are being fleeted through on Main 2. They pass at restricted speed with bells and whistles. UP 7979 East is seen again as it ducks under Interstate 80.
As we can see, the track panels have been bolted together. The joints will be welded at a more opportune time. At the east end of Peru, seven flat cars loaded with additional track panels are standing by on Main 1, while work continues on around the clock to get the railroad fully restored to service. The afternoon sun makes some interesting patterns in the clouds as we look to the east and our final destination of Green River. Rewinding five months, here is Peru in late March, as UP 5400 West leads a stack train up Main 1, the same route the ill-fated stack train took. As the rear of the train passes through what was to become the derailment site, let's turn east. The Green River is a chief tributary of the Colorado and winds over 730 miles from the Wind River Mountains of Wyoming through the Colorado Plateau. After leaving Peru, the railroad heads down an easy grade along the bank of the river before entering the yard. Eastbound grain empties are nearly cloaked by the snow as the train enters town.
Several distinct rock formations mark your arrival to Green River. Tollgate Rock is located just west of town, near the Palisades. It got its name from a toll road which once existed here. Coined Nature's Art Shop, these formations have captivated travelers for centuries. The most noted landmark associated with Green River is Castle Rock. In fact, nearly every historic photograph of town features it. This view is from Union Pacific's historic Green River Yard. Green River began life as a state station along the Cherokee Trail known as Adobe Town or Old Town. The UP first laid rails here in 1868, but originally decided to build its yard to the west at Bryan. A drought in 1872 led the UP to reconsider their plans and build the yard here, and it remains an important hub to this day. A pedestrian bridge crosses over the west end of the yard and gives you a great vantage point to watch trains coming in for a crew change at the depot. UP 8364 West has just come off the Rollins subdivision and the outbound crew pulls a train past the depot and out of the yard. As the 8364 departs, it meets an eastbound stack train led by UP 5440. The transcontinental main line is definitely a busy place. With a blast of hot diesel exhaust, the rear DPUs pass beneath us as a train heads out of town. With the crew change complete, the UP 5440 resumes its eastward journey. As it departs, a yard job using a remote-controlled SD40-2 shuffles cars around the busy yard.
The rear of the eastbound Z train passes beneath us as the UP 5440 heads out on the Rollins subdivision on a journey that'll eventually take it over legendary Sherman Hill and into Cheyenne. But that's a story for another time. In 2013, Union Pacific announced its plans to restore Big Boy No. 4014 to operating condition. In the spring of that following year, the 4014 was moved from the Rail Giants Train Museum in Pomona, California to the UP Steam Program Headquarters in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Our coverage of the historic move begins at Ogden, Utah. It is the 5th of May, and a crowd is on hand to see the locomotive before it continues its journey. The 4014 was delivered to the Union Pacific in December of 1941, and it ran for 20 years, racking up over 1,031,000 miles before being retired. It is one of 25 big boy locomotives built. Two EMD SD-70Ms were chosen to power this special train, the UP-4014 and the 4884. After all, the big boy has a 4884 wheel arrangement. The big boys originally operated between Ogden and Green River, and it was good to see the 4014 on its home rails again. The next morning, we are set up along the Weber River, just east of Devil's Gate. Although off camera, a sizable crowd has assembled to see the big boy pass. The crew of an empty coal train running ahead of the 4014 ham it up for the photographers. A second eastbound also passes on the westbound track. UP Dispatcher 6 wants to get these trains out of the way before running the special, since it is limited to 25 miles per hour, and will have to make stops to lubricate the running gear. Finally, the 4014 approaches. The steam crew is using the train's air to blow the whistle, which is why it sounds a little different. The special is seen again passing milepost 970, just two miles west of Morgan, Utah. A group of photographers are gathered on a knoll overlooking the main line at Castle Rock to watch a big boy ascending the Wasatch grade. This is the grade the locomotives were originally made for. Union Pacific considered calling them the Wasatch type before the big boy name stuck.
We join another photo line at the Big Cut, which bypassed the Summit Tunnel for Main 2 at Wasatch. The realignment was done specifically so the Big Boy could be used on this line. At 11.18 a.m., the UP-4014 crested the Wasatch Mountains for the first time in over half a century. A large crowd is on hand at Evanston, Wyoming to greet the 4014, which will be making a 30-minute stop. Looker snap photos, the steam crew shoots the rods with grease. Soon the big boy resumes its 11-day, 1,250-mile journey to Cheyenne. A solid yellow shows on Main 2 at Granger, Wyoming. Another eastbound is just ahead.
The sun breaks out momentarily at Green River as we again take advantage of the pedestrian footbridge that crosses the busy yard. As you can see, we are not the only spectators. Green River has also turned out to welcome the 4014. The excitement builds, especially among the younger members of the crowd, as a historic locomotive appears. The 4014 arrived in Cheyenne on May 8, 2014, to wait its turn to be restored to operating condition. As of this production in August of 2016, the big boy has recently been moved to the steam shop and the restoration work has officially begun. Original estimates were that it would take up to five years to complete. We wish the Union Pacific steam crew good luck, and like many steam fans, Look forward to the day when the 4014 leaves Cheyenne under her own power. In the meantime, we hope you've enjoyed your tour of this incredible line through the spectacular scenery and history of Utah and Wyoming. Until next time, thanks for watching.